This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week our guest is saxophonist Tim McAllister. Tim is the sap, uh, soprano chair of the Prism Quartet and an associate professor of saxophone and co-director of the Institute for New Music at the Beenan School of Music at Northwestern University. He will premiere John Adams' new saxophone concerto in Australia with the Symfon- uh, Sydney Symphony on August 22nd with the composer at the podium. And U.S. performances will follow in Baltimore and St. Louis and further on in Brazil with the Sao Paulo Symphony. Tim, thanks for being on the show. Great. Thanks for having me so much. Appreciate it. Um, so, full disclosure, I do work for Boozy and Hawk, so that should be known here. But <laughs> We've since, heard. Um, yes, we, we've, we've all heard. However, um, we've all, I mean, the everyone is really super excited about the saxophone concerto. I mean, that's totally true. And um, we all know Tim's reputation of having been a great saxophonist. We love the Prism Quartet. And I mean, there's nobody better really to play this piece. And we're just all super excited that it's going to be happening in a couple of weeks, really. It's coming up fast. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, um, so how has it been working with John and, and kind of putting this together as we're coming up to the performance soon? Oh, it's, it's really been quite exhilarating. Um, you know, he's really been throughout my career. He's, he's really been at the top of the composers that I've, I've followed and whose music I've loved. But, uh, I think we've all seen his career just unfold. So interestingly, you know, as we you know, associate him with, we associate him with minimalism, but we've seen just the tra- trajectory of that just really shift and move into these kind of large scale, you know, deep romantic works. But, um, the opportunity to, to be with him, sit with him, go through sketches, uh, play for him, get feedback, and, and just his perspective on on, on what I do, uh, which is actually quite quite different. It's a it's, it's a really different take on what he's what he's wanting to do and what he's trying to do. But the opportunity to, to collaborate with him more more so than just even waiting for a piece to appear and then. And then playing that piece and then just hearing from the composer at the end, uh, just the the opportunity to work with him all along, um, step by step has just been, has been fantastic. And, and, and it, it was really born out of a necessity to, for him, he was essentially writing this piece relatively quickly. Uh, he, he, he has said in some ways, this really took off fast. Just the, the orchestras that got on board to commission it, the uh, the timeline for the premiere and and even the subsequent recording it also ha- it happened so fast while he was in the middle of revising uh, the last two pieces that he's written absolute jest and then the gospel according to the, to the other Mary he was really deeply involved in even rewriting those pieces um, when he really needed to be starting this concerto he really needed to be on the on on the ball with that so he felt a little pressured to to get it done. But I remember, I mean, it was something, I think it was a year ago, I had just got some email that said, I've got something. And, <laughs> and it said, and some, and, and, and more to come, more to follow. And then, you know, kind of time went by and then things just kind of slow started to show. These are like cryptic little messages. That yeah. Like, he's just, he's, he's, watch the, out. <laughs> he's the master of cryptic email. I mean, I will send like a giant, like one meg email and then I get <laughs> a paragraph back. And, um, but, uh, but starting around February, uh, I started to get some sketches of, of this big, large first part, which is now really called the first movement. But I think his original sense of the piece was that it was going to be three movements all under one big arch. Uh, but it's, he's kind of divided it up a little bit since. But started to get some sketches, and then I had the opportunity uh, to work with him when uh, I recorded City Noir with St. Louis and David Robertson in February. And John was there for the entire week, and we were able to work in a dressing room and start, and I was able to just start playing through sketches for him. Uh, and, and that was really just, that was a moment where it just felt very real. Like this is happening. I mean, this is happening. Yeah. And, and it's, it's kind of incredible just, and I think it was exciting for him to hear the, to hear those notes. I mean, other than like a MIDI playback <laughs> uh, for him to just really now get a sense, okay, here's, here's where this is going to go. I, I would like to think that some of the things that I've done with the piece or some of the things I've done with, 
with uh, sound and interpretation has even influenced him as he mm-hmm. as he worked to build more and, and, and write more of the piece. I think by the time I started playing the, the sketches of the first movement, he'd only just started to finish out and round out this big giant first part. Um, so I think going forward, maybe I had some influence on him too. I would like, I'd like to think. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, you know, I mean like uh, often I, you know, working with these performers that you get used to working with, I mean like your relationship as far back from city noir, um, mm-hmm. you know, is certainly a big influence, I'm sure. Um, and I, in your program and in, in his program, no, he speaks really highly of you too. Um, <laughs> as, a as as I'm sure the the earlier project with City Noir really like kind of put put you on the map with him and developed your relationship more. Yes. Um, so I mean, this concerto though, I mean, you can certainly see in in John's writing and even talks about this um, is developed from or is is related a lot to some of the scales and patterns that we've seen in his latest work, such as the Gospel According to the Other Mary. Um, so, I mean, in your relationship with John, having sure. what kinds of things would you say have affected the evolution of this new piece? Uh, in terms of just like... Uh, in terms of running through sketches, things like that. I mean, it, do you guys constantly b- bounce ideas off each other with what will work in this certain instance and so forth? Yeah, it was, in, uh, it was interesting because when I... Uh, when we first, well, I mean, a little history. So I was, I was doing, I was playing the piece with him uh, down in Miami with the New World Symphony, and and we were, we we decided to have dinner one night, and he was coming back from a little photo shoot or something he had to do with with some patrons, and um, we were walking back, and he, you know, he, he just kind of, I mean, he's, I think we, those of us who know him, he's he's relatively shy, of course, and uh, but he. But we were just walking, and he said, I, I think I need to write you a piece. And, <laughs> and, of course, and, of course, you know, it, like, hit me, like, in my stomach. I felt like, I mean, it was, like, just this surge of excitement. And of course, I had to, like, play it cool. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> but I didn't want to look like a, you know, just a, like a, you know. Like a fanboy? Like a school kid on Christmas, right. you know, school boy on Christmas morning, you know, or something. I don't, but I, uh, um, we started to talk about. I, what would that what that might be and then he he just started asking questions and i kind of always envisioned that if there was a piece from him it would it would take on a form of uh, something similar to the clarinet concerto gnarly buttons most of yeah. us are familiar with great piece. Sort of that, that great piece of sort of that size of orchestra or the size of chamber ensemble something that that is connected to the the sound world of the chamber symphony and the son of chamber symphony and and sort of, I, I kind of imagined that that would be his forte and how he would write for saxophone. Like, he, then he said, "I'm not really into unaccompanied works like solo pieces, like these, like these grand sequences of Barrio or whatever." Uh, and and and, uh, and then also, I, he's just when it comes to wind music, he's really never written wind chamber music, for instance. So you're not going to find a, an oboe and piano piece or a clarinet piano piece of John Adams. And, um, and, and so he was just kind of feeling out what kind of medium that might be. And I remember him asking something like, uh, 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 do I need to write some multiphonics or something? You know, <laughs> and, and, and I think it was, and I told him, I, you know, and I said that I just don't associate that with your, your sound world. I wouldn't expect that you would need to do this. I mean, I think you would, you should write what you would want to write. Um, but I, but I think from from the beginning he had a sense of of where I, I think he had a sense rightfully so that that my tastes were were intersecting with his uh, mm-hmm. and and I think otherwise he might not have really shown the interest in me early on uh, and then I did send him a lot of recordings uh, of myself and Prism I mean I, my my initial idea and, and hope was that he would consider writing a saxophone quartet for Prism we were the ones that were. Yeah, we're we're comparative, comparatively just more visible than than me as a soloist, um, and then uh, we also were the sax quartet in the Colorado Opera recording of Nixon in China. So Marin also brought us in for that, and that really started that relationship. So he was aware of us, he knew about us, and that's really what led to to uh, him knowing who I was when it was when 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 he essentially chose chose me to play City Noir, but. So I, I was kind of pushing a lot of the re- quartet recordings on him, and his son 
study with Martin Bresnik at, at Yale, and uh, uh, and we, we have this recording of, of Martin's saxophone quartet, which is a really just breathtaking piece, and uh, he was very interested in that. Um, so I was maybe even dropping that, and then it was, he was just kind of quiet, and he didn't really bring it up again. And, um, of course, that was all just in my head all night long. That's all I could think about. And then, and, and then really, uh, I, I decided I couldn't let this, I just couldn't let this slide. I mean, there are times when, when you, when you meet with a composer or a performer or other performers or a conductor and they'll say, let's, we've got to really work together sometime. We've got to work together. You know, you hear that and it's code for, you know, uh, don't, don't call me, I'll call you. Um, <laughs> and I knew, I knew I couldn't let this slide. I, I, I so I remember returning home from that trip and just, mentioning something in email, thanking him for the opportunity again. He brought me down there to Miami, but also just uh, saying it would be amazing someday. Uh, uh, and I would do anything I needed to do to help, you know, raise money or look at grants or whatever I'd have to do to make something like that happen. And, and he just wrote back and said, uh, um, don't worry about that. If it's going to, if it happens, it's going to happen kind of thing. And I'll let you know. And then really kind of almost two years went by. And then there was an email out of the blue that said, "This here's what I'm going to do," and nice. this is uh, I just I'm finishing up this big this big oratorio, and the next piece I'm wanting to do is a piece for you, and uh, my idea is to do it down in Sydney, and uh, if you're if you're too busy, I would understand, and we can figure <laughs> out, we can figure out another date someday, and you know. I think I was literally in a, in a waffle house or something when I got that email and I think I dropped the phone. So I, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I, uh, I knew that, that this was moving really fast and it was really exciting, but I, I, I feel that, that maybe what really influenced the piece first beyond his the influences he talks about in this piece was just that relationship with city noir. I think he, he knew what he could write or what he could write for or how he could write. Um, I, th I think he wasn't interested in, or he hasn't been interested in writing a piece that is so challenging that, that no one can play it um, or, or that, that maybe only I could play it because of that relationship or what he wants. I mean, um, so it, it, in some ways, in some ways, uh, even though City Noir is not a prolonged solo piece, there are moments in City Noir that are, that are frighteningly difficult. Uh, some of it gets embedded in the orchestra. Some of it doesn't have that projection that, that a soloist would have out in front of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. I've even had people sometimes say, well, why didn't you just put the saxophone out front, you know, uh, for that piece? But it's not, that's not the piece. I mean, that's not the piece. Um, but th there are things in that, there are things in City Noir that, that it took multiple times to perform it and practice it uh, and then keep coming back to it to, to further polish it, to feel like I was in command of some of that material. Um, and at the end of January, uh, when I play it with him in Houston symphony, I will have played it. I will have played it 26 times. Wow. And that's a lot. I mean, for a saxophone player, uh, <laughs> and a saxophone player in kind of that symphony orchestra mainstream, that's, that's a lot. And, um, so I do feel now the piece is just part of me. I mean, the, the, the technique built into that or the, 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 the difficulty of the piece, everything about it has been assimilated into my playing. Mm. And, and in some ways, then it, it just stated, and then it's sort of the concerto is born out of that. Uh, and I think the, the sound I was going for and the sound he was looking for in that piece has informed the concerto, and yet he's wanted to take it a step further. Whereas maybe the playing in City Noir is more referential. This playing is a little bit more explicit that he wants this kind of crossover sound or a sound that, a sound that really can't be, I, I, it's not particularly um, uh, identifiable with what it is. Is it a classical right. sound? Is it a classical approach? Is it a jazz approach? Mm -hmm. Is it something in between? Um, and that's been kind of fun because he's really, if there's anything he's, he has steered more than anything else, it's been the sound concept for the piece. And he talks about this in his notes and it's had a, it's had a pretty strong impact on my playing was throughout working on this piece. But I have found that it's now found it's, I have found that it has worked its way into a, a lot of what I do just as a player to the point that, that maybe it's, it's impacting just my overall approach, my overall approach to playing the instrument and uh, uh, just kind of the core literature that we talk about or the core mm -hmm. repertoire we talk right. about. Um, um, 
are you playing? Uh, you talk about the sound being sort of. Is it is it a jazz sound? Is it a classical sound? Are you playing? This is the sax nerd question. Are you playing your standard mouthpiece setup for this? Yeah, I mean, yes. I, I just am. rolled my eyes at you over the internet, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Here's, yeah. Here's nerd nerd alert. You know, nerd talk. Right. You know, uh, I know how it is. The 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 shop talk. I mean, that's crucial. You know, and and it, it does. I, I my equipment was greatly impacted uh, after playing City Noir. There 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 was really no way you can uh you there's no way you can uh, approximate or replicate the, the the texture you play against when you sit in an orchestra like the LA Philharmonic where you have a, a massive string section and and you have in that piece of course you've got you've got ex- extensions and all the wind family six horns four clarinets you have two harps you have you have just massive walls of percussion around you <laughs> and I felt, and I, and I found that okay, uh, I'm I'm playing a piece now where I've really, really got to blow. I've got to crank, and yet I don't want to feel like I have to shift to something. I don't want to shift to some like really foreign, uh, really foreign uh, setup that that's more akin to like rock and roll saxophone. Something that's just you know built on playing loud over amplified sources or or through an amplified source. I wanted to I wanted to be able to uh, approximate a, a sound that that he was looking for without um, getting outside of my classical setup. And nice. so, uh, in the first ex- the first performances of that, uh, I, I had to learn how to play bigger. And and I and I always had pushed that when I played some of these larger scale concertos. We have some pieces, for instance, for saxophone and winds. You know, uh, these big kind of massive concertos and. Uh, like Ingolf Dahl and some of these names, but where you've got to play big, you just have to really push over the group. In this case, I, I had to, I had to, I had to bring that quality of playing from deep within the orchestra, the deeply embedded in the orchestra. So I did stick with the setup, but I think I tweaked it. I started to look at whatever I could find, ligatures and 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 different um, different platings and things on the neck. And so I, I remember coming back after the first wave of performances with Willie Phil. And I and I changed, you know, the, the neck, the vocal to a gold plated, and I changed. I had to went to a different kind of ligature, an Ishimori ligature, all this kind of equipment talk. But it actually then, uh, in I, I went through an entire. I just changed my entire saxophone within about a year or two. I guess it was maybe two years, and I went to a fully like gold plated saxophone, which which just is louder and bigger and and still dark and and warm, but just this projection. And uh, I think, but more importantly, it, it, it caused me to rethink how I just interface with the saxophone. Whereas everything may have been for a long time based on chamber playing or solo playing or solo and piano or sax quartet or something like that. This was about forging a, a classical sound that was as big and as maybe, maybe brash or bold as the largest jazz sounds. That we hear, you know, with a with a you know these iconic players like a Joe Lovano or a, um, or, or even kind of older. Um, it's, it's, it's great to hear you. That, Go ahead. It's interesting that you know there's lots of world class saxophone players out there who never get a chance to play with an orchestra as often as you have. Yeah. So you know, um, it seemed like you you know as to be expected, the more you get to do it, the more you learn about how it works. And it's a shame that more saxophone players don't get that experience. Um, I was thinking about the piece itself, and you compared, or you brought up Gnarly Buttons. And Gnarly Buttons is certainly a very challenging piece, but not in in how, like, there, you can't point at individual technique spots and say, this is impossible or this is impossible. It's sort of the relentlessness of it that makes it really hard. And I was wondering if uh, this piece... The, the the new sax concerto has kind of has that same approach. I, I I actually I think you you kind of nailed it in that regard. It's uh, it, it, it there, there's 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 no specific moment. There actually may be sort of one page in this piece that that basically even with a week to go, I'm still woodshedding. You know, because uh, it's just really really hard. Um, and 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 things there are challenges sort of within that are that are sort of embedded in these just larger things that are going on it is it is very similar there is there is a relentlessness about it the piece keeps coming at you you know 
you turn the page and there's more and you turn the page there's more um and 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 of course the the dynamic marking on all of it is fortissimo you know so he he's he's asking i mean there are a few moments where the audience gets to just relax and he and he goes into much more of a subdued sound world if you're familiar with if you can remember the second movement of city noir there's there's this opening it's called this, this song the song is for you and and it has a very similar vibe. The piece just kind of deconstructs and, and and as he as he mentions, kind of just fragments apart into this really st- uh, st- static sound world. So he he does move into that uh, that that relief for the for the listener uh, at, at this point, uh, sort of in the same timing of the piece, or somewhere around uh, you know ten minutes or eight minutes into the first movement. But in, but but until that, it's just it's straight big loud playing that that take that does take its toll on you i mean that that as i mentioned i i i mentioned it uh, when discussing the piece recently uh uh that 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 might be where the true virtuosity of the piece resides within this this ability to play in this incredibly sustained way you're blowing and you're pushing and you're you're leading the orchestra the orchestra is sort of surging behind you it's as if the the saxophone is sort of the general, so to speak, and and mm-hmm. everything everything is just sort of right there with you. Uh, it, it's not, as I've said, as I've said recently as well, it's not this detached personality where you have the soloist as sort of protagonist, you know, the hero sort of. And you have this bravura personality in the front, and then this really kind of subservient texture behind you. He writes a it's a total piece for the whole for the whole orchestra. Mm-hmm. He just has he just has this un, uh, amazing ability to, to 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 orchestrate and and create and create windows in the texture that allow the saxophone to come through. And then when he wants the texture to overtake you, he still wants the saxophone to be heard. And when that happens, you have to kick it into a new gear. And there are some of us that 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 don't experience that sometimes. When I've had students, for instance. You know, young aspiring students that are looking at academia or looking at getting opportunities through maybe concerto competitions and contests and whatnot, and they'll be working on these grand concertos, but they've never played them with anything other than piano reductions. And I'll say to them, your true education will happen the day you step on stage and you have just this wall of sound behind you, and you have to figure out how to compete with that. And a lot of people think, well, that's no big deal. It's saxophone, it's not violin. And, and, and sometimes that's really misleading because the saxophone, as much as we think of it as a really kind of loud brass instrument, it sits in a really kind of complex harmonic position in the sound world of the symphony orchestra. It can be swallowed up really quickly. Yeah. Uh, some of that, so it's, frequencies get canceled. There's all this kind of stuff. So if you're playing, if there's one saxophone player and there's six horns playing, you won't hear the saxophone. There's just something about that, 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 the overtone makeup of the instrument and the violin plays high enough and, and, and has sort of a, 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 a focused piercing that can make it through that sound world sometimes. Yeah. And it's right in the middle of like the grand staff with the alto saxophone, especially is like yeah. right in the middle. It's really easy to get swallowed up by all those pitches above and below it that are in yeah. the orchestra. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It's great to hear you talk about like really like absorbing city noir and yeah. getting to perform it so many times. I think that's something that uh, a lot of times we don't get to hear performances of, I mean, Adams is kind of an exception because he's such a, a rock star that his music gets played all the time and orchestras really do get the opportunity to a, a absorb it and embody it. And kind of, you know, kind of the difference between reciting the lines of a play and being that character um, yeah. is, is what, I'm hearing when you're describing City Noir, and it's really great to hear that this new piece is going to get all of these different performances, and and you, you're going to have the opportunity to do that all over again. And, and the 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 first world premiere coming up in a in a in just a couple of weeks, um, and you're saying that you're still woodshedding things. So it's I can't wait to hear how the piece kind of evolves after this performance and into these these subsequent uh performances is that is that something you're looking forward to working on yeah absolutely i i mean the, the recording on october 5th and 6th with uh, uh with st louis in some ways i mean i obviously i obviously want to be presenting a piece to the best of my abilities before that and 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 then the and the american premiere with uh with baltimore and Marin also i mean that that's huge um but 
the recording is where I need to peak. I mean, the recording is where it needs to be at its very best, and I don't get a year or two to just live with it. Um, I do feel by the time I recorded City Noir with St. Louis, there was just this, this, I mean, I'd lived with the piece from 2009 until February 2013. And that, that really made me feel, I mean, I felt great about that recording. Um, and, and, and I think they're going to do a really great job. I mean, just none such knows what they're doing, how to, I mean, they know what they're doing with an Adams orchestra. Uh, they know how to, to, to really just create a, a fantastic mix. So I think it's even going to be much better than that, um, that DVD that came out of the Dudamel uh, premiere, which, which Adams would send me an email a few times that said, you know, they put you way down in the mix. It's as if they were just trying to subdue the saxophone entirely, and he was really upset about that. Uh-huh. So um, he was trying to get them to bring it all back, back up out of the mix to, to actually be much more indicative of how I actually played. And when I hear that, when I hear that um, uh, recording, I don't really hear what I, I don't hear the saxophone the way I felt I was actually playing. So I think that was just them trying to balance it all out and create kind of a, a very, in some ways, a very, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a static mix somehow, something that didn't peak out too much or something. But um, uh, I think trying so. to make it so you can listen to it on the car stereo. Right. <laughs> exactly. I, think, I, I think so. Um, Compression. But with, with the none such recording, I think there will be this sense that, 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 the way I the way I truly was playing will be represented somehow, um, so it almost will come off as a, like a solo album in some ways. But I mean, those moments actually after the initial I think the first three performances with, with um, or actually the first no there was only one performance with Dudamel uh, in, for the premiere, and then we came back uh, I think a month and a half later and played three performances of it as part of this uh, they call it. Uh, West Coast Left Coast Festival with L.A. Mm-hmm. Phil, and and we played Sing Noir three times, and that was considered the pre-tour performances. So starting in those three performances, from that point forward, uh, John said, I want you to stand in these, these, there's three moments in the piece, I want you to stand from your position and perform. Um, and then that's how it's been done ever since. Well, when I recorded it um, with St. Louis, I couldn't stand because they, they put a, they had a, had a great microphone on me, and it was really, a, 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 it was a different microphone than everyone else. It was, it, was, it was really meant to just pick me up, almost like a soloist. But if I, if I stood and they had to, they set the levels and the mix for that, it was just messing yeah. all up. So, mm-hmm. so in some ways, the recording, was, it was about the recording and not about the, uh, the visual aspect of it. The theatrical aspect of, of, the, of the saxophone was kind of darting darting up out of the texture and he kind of <laughs> he mentions that in his program notes of city noir he talks about this, the saxophone is like this this rogue interloper who you know some like some guy just runs into the street and starts wailing and runs off you know <laughs> like some <laughs> kind of, some kind of image where 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 the, where just the for for one little moment the orchestra is disturbed or somehow perverted by this element but um but uh, anyway, so it was it was it was exciting because the audience took part in that. Uh, they, they were they were instructed to be as quiet as possible. They were passing out lozenges every 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 chance they could get to to cut down on that. And uh, that was a really exciting and, and really vibrant uh, performance because we knew it was really going to be the the, the major takes for that for that recording. It's really interesting. I. Uh... I had the opportunity of seeing you perform this with the Grand Rapids Symphony, I believe. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, it was a, a brilliant thing to see. And it's really interesting to me hearing you talk about performing in this so many different times with different groups. I was wondering if you found different things in the piece as you or with working with different orchestras, with different conductors and in different contexts. Yeah, you know, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And, and, and it's something I've thought about a lot because it... It, it to be able to just uh, kind of drift, so to speak, yeah. uh, between between these different organizations, you, you you learn to tap in very quickly to the culture of that organization and the culture of, or the relationship with the conductor and what the conductor is going to bring to that, and you know right away how serious it's, how serious of an experience this is going to be, or is this going to be something under rehearsed, thrown together? Is this going to be something that that the players check out of, or, or is this going to be the kind of thing where the players are terrified of it? You know, and, 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 and I guess what really led to John requesting me or at least bringing me in 
uh, or, or asking that I be brought in uh, more and more, uh, he, he, he felt that the, the saxophone player has to be the last concern. We, we can't have, uh, we can't be dealing with all, all of the, the, the difficulty of the piece and then the fact that it's really new and most of these musicians won't get their parts more than maybe, maybe a month in advance at most. Um, and and he, he always felt, at least when he was conducting, and he has conducted it with other saxophonists, uh, and, uh, but in Europe he did, he, he's done it a couple of times, and he didn't have particularly positive experiences. And he felt that he was having to devote too much energy to just helping the saxophonist through this part or helping the saxophonist understand the leadership role as if the saxophonist, saxophonist is quarterbacking the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what led to that is him feeling like I bring a stability there and something that the players maybe can latch on to. And it's been interesting for me. I guess uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself to be just – at my best and feeling my best and sounding my best in that very first rehearsal, that very first reading mm -hmm. is everything because they're going to make a decision right away, whether or not this, this sax guy was worth it bringing this guy in, or they're going to make a decision really quickly and whether or not the piece just matters. And the sax and, and the saxophone certainly sends that message really quickly that, that uh, this, you know, he means business with this piece, and and uh, and and uh, I've taken a, I've taken a lot of uh, responsibility on my shoulders to just represent our profession in that very first rehearsal, and I've seen uh, I've seen orchestras rally around me a little bit um, because there and then many woodwind players saying coming up to me and saying. We're so we're so glad you're here, uh, <laughs> and, and, and or you know I mean you know because there is this idea that the saxophone drives that whole piece, um, and 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 as a result I've I've actually heard I mean this happened in Grand Rapids actually Grand Rapids had the best clarinet section of any I, I felt it was the best <laughs> clarinet section of any group I've ever played with. That's wonderful. Uh, I'll tell them you said that. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, well, they're great guys. They bring it. They brought in Peyton McDonald from the Ice Ensemble. Uh, their, their regular guy is he's, he's from L.A. He actually played gnarly buttons for John Adams in his house once to get wow. some you know feedback. Um, but they were but the two of the clarinet players are there's the primary bass clarinetist for the piece, and then there's a, another utility clarinetist who doubles um, uh, B flat, maybe E flat two, and bass. But those guys were monsters. I mean, and they, well, once they understood how this was going to work, how this was going to go down, okay, this sax part is a big deal. We're playing parts that really interface with this. We're just going to create this really wall of woodwind sound. They really just kind of woke up in some ways to what, what this was going to be. And and so, because some people do their homework, I mean, some people will reference or listen to the Dudamel recording and they get a sense of what they're up against. Um, and a lot of people know me through that recording when I've gone to play with these orchestras, um, but but it's not until they hear it that they realize what they're what they're in for. And uh, mm -hmm. so I've loved that. I've I've loved that uh, going into those situations where again you know you're the outsider, you're the sax player, and this goes all the way. I mean, this is like just completely tied to the history of our instrument to begin <laughs> with. You know, we do have all these moments in that early French literature, you know, Bizet and. Uh, Ravel orchestrations and uh, you know a lot of these French composers particularly and then for Kofiev and Shostakovich and things but you you go uh, Rachmaninoff you go into these situations where you have this one moment and these composers will will set up the orchestration where everything drops out so that we can hear this little saxophone and the saxophone is this this uh, it's emblematic of sort of the common man or the music of the streets it's not I mean this is all even before jazz the idea that somehow the saxophone was like a representative of bourgeois culture or whatever. So it, it's a melancholy instrument. It wasn't really meant, none of those events in, the, in, these, in these, these, these showcase orchestra pieces really showcase anything technically about the saxophone. It's always this kind of subdued, melancholy, beautiful kind of bel canto sound. Um, and uh, those that don't do their homework with sitting where I don't realize that the saxophone is just this kind of raging you know, the part and the very first big solo in that piece is this kind of like, I, I call it the Eric Dolphy space freak out solo yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's because he writes this really hard solo that is completely 
rhythmically detached from the whole orchestra, but I'm still, but it's all the same meters. But he, he has this way, he has this uncanny way of writing something that sounds, and it is devilishly hard, but what makes it hard is how he has, how he has set it up rhythmically by being offset from what else is going on. So it actually sounds like written improvisation. And I've had people ask, is that written out? I mean, cause <laughs> what I've, and what I brought to it, what I started to bring to it and I, and he, uh, references this a little bit was that I have ja- I have jazz training I have a jazz background uh, I wouldn't call myself a jazz artist or a jazz musician uh, because of just where my life has gone and the things that I that I'm, I'm most passionate about with my instrument right now and it's certainly really difficult to it's certainly difficult to have a level or a, a, an ability that that or a special a specialization in two really in some ways, unrelated areas of our instrument. They've gone, they've departed from each other so severely that, that it, 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 we just don't have, or Sam, you know, we don't have like an example of a Chris Potter and a Don Senta all in one human being. Right. You know, we, we just don't, we, we don't have that. And I don't think, I almost, I mean, it, it could be controversial to say, but I just don't think that's possible. Yeah, I mean, that's something we've, we've talked about on the show with saxophone music before. And in, in, as you said, Adams mentions it in his notes. He talks about John Coltrane and Eric Dolphy and Wayne Shorter in the note for, for this concerto. And when I first read things like that, my first reaction is that it's a little bit facile to just say, oh, it's a saxophone, it's like jazz, here's some, some jazz-like stuff. But at the same time, especially for a piece like this that's one of a small small handful of works for saxophone and orchestra it would i think also be a little bit disingenuous to not at least address that um common conception of what the saxophone is and does and is is for even in a world that includes you know you mentioned Ingolf Dahl or Kurel Husa or you know Jacinto Chelsea or um, you know any of these these great composers that have written things that are relatively far removed from jazz, but at at the same time, this is when you stand in front of a big crowd of people in an orchestra hall with holding a saxophone. I think there's an expectation, right? Yeah, I mean certainly that's the, that's the perception of what you're going to experience, and you can either play into that, and then you you could you could easily go too far. To, to, to the Absolutely. point that that it becomes like this just kind of a cliche uh, or, 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 you know, I mean, we sometimes say we talk about this with prism a lot. You know, we may we, we may spend if, if we raise money over a period of years to commission somebody uh, big, for instance. And a lot of times we target or go after a composer who who is writing their first saxophone piece. And in this case, we want it to be a quartet. Not all the time, and certainly we look for people who have some experience writing for saxophone sometimes first, but we'll go after somebody, and, and we, we are always hopeful, and, and, and we sort of secretly wince. We don't want this to be this person's first attempts at writing something jazzy. <laughs> you know? right. those, were, those were air quotes if anybody's just listening to the audio. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, it, 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 it sometimes terrifies us to think that this person whose music we came to love, uh, for, for many reasons removed from you know, jazz genre, is going to finally look at their opportunity to, to branch out into an area. That, that they really don't have any maybe mastery of or experience within. So suddenly we start to see blue scales and we just freak out. It's really upsetting sometimes, <laughs> you know. So, um, uh, you know, but that, that's, I, that, that's, rel- that's been relatively you know, few and far, far between. But um, we, want, we want composers to take the instrument seriously. We want the, the composers to see it on the same level of, 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 of expectation that we would we would see with the rdd string quartet or chronos or a group like eighth blackbird i mean if someone wrote a piece for eighth blackbird and they wrote a piece for for us we'd want them to have the same seriousness of intent but at the same time you can't escape you cannot escape this emblematic nature of the saxophone it is what it is we, and 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 i completely cherish that and, and understand that and and, and believe that that we can't turn our backs on that i mean we're talking about an instrument that single-handedly overtook and became the you know poster child for an entire genre of music yeah and uh and and yes you could say 
uh, trumpet also has its has a, a, a deep uh, a, a deep presence in the jazz world or trombone or drums or what but it's saxophone i mean it is just <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 saxophone. saxophone doesn't have the canon also of those other things back end of it. in other that's genres why i think it has. Right. It's, exactly. interesting to, it's interesting to me you talk about how you can go too far with the jazz thing um i think composers should realize not stylistically, not trying to make it sound like jazz, but sort of the techniques and the ways of playing that jazzers tend to, to have. And, and they should realize that even the most dyed-in-the-wool, air quote, <laughs> classical saxophone player, if they're well-trained, just by necessity, they're going to have some knowledge of how to play jazz. Yeah. And how to, not stylistic, I mean, stylistically, of course, but how to control the instrument the way you think of a jazzer controlling the instrument. And to fold that into a very serious piece of art music. And, mm -hmm. and that's a tricky thing for a composer because, as we said, it can sound pretty dorky pretty fast. Right. Um, but if, if done right, it can be very effective, I think. I, and I actually truly believe that, that John has done this right. I mean, I think exactly what you're saying. When those moments appear, they appear in a way that is so organic and, and built into the fabric of the, of, the, of the texture at that moment or the sound at that moment. And, and you'll, you'll identify moments that sound like, oh, that, that kind of was reminiscent of a jazz riff. And, but, of course, some of that has to come from me, too, because he, he will write maybe a figure he might write a figure that has no markings about it. He'll write sort of one big slur mark, and and he's and he's just relying upon me to to know um, idiomatically how I might embellish that or how I might uh, just alter the articulations to reference sort of a bebop style, mm -hmm. or maybe a more maybe more kind of a cool a cool jazz sound. So so some of that's built into the music, but I also. Some of that was really clear in, in the initial readings of it, but sometimes I needed him to also point it out because sometimes it wasn't totally clear. And uh, you know, he'd, he'd you know he'd say, "Can you sound you know right there? Can you sound more like Phil Woods right there?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and 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 uh, and I'm like, "Well, okay, that's a pretty loaded statement because we, <laughs> what what are you really looking for?" And then I would start to what I would think, at least in my experiences, I'd start to. To, to, to shape that and, and maybe embellish it in a way that I thought was consistent with what he was looking for. And then he'd be like, no, 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 too far, or I don't want that. Uh, but okay, what, okay, what do you want? And then, and then I would start to back off on that meter, so to speak, or I'd, I'd turn yeah. down the volume knob of the jazz references, and I'd start to move something more neutral, and that's what he wanted. So it, it was really hard, even in the re initial readings, to just, to just get a sense of exactly what he wanted, um, the one thing that he really jumped on me about, though, and, and, and which I think was completely legitimate and founded, uh, was the, uh, uh, these kind of cliches of classical playing that, that have entered into our world over time, and that is references to French playing. We talk about the French school of saxophone, and which is, which is uh, uh, heavily influenced by a very uh, regulated, narrow vibrato that has sort of a, a, almost a prescribed... A prescribed speed and a, right. a prescribed depth, and and of course the French school, that's French school of vibrato, or at least the French school from the 1940s and 50s. Uh, that of course was really uh, attempting to reflect vibrato of the time for other instruments. I mean, if you listen to high fits, if you or you listen to Pablo Casals, you listen to singers like Maria Callas, and you listen to. Uh, you know, wood, uh, flute and oboe playing at the time. That's all the French school players were attempting to do was to just basically put the saxophone on the same le level field in, ter in terms of how vibrato was used. And then what happened is maybe as those things started to migrate away from the same kind of vibrato. I mean, violinists don't play like high fits anymore. I mean, if you, th 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 there's there's certainly a sense that the, the, that 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 has very slowly organically moved away from that, but they don't sound like that. Um, there's a there's a little bit more attention to how vibrato is used to create tension and and how it's used to to highlight the structure of a piece rather than being this on texture all the time. Mm -hmm. So saxophone players really adapted uh, adopted I guess uh, in some ways looked to a an, an anchor a tradition that they could hold they could hold on to and say we're going to now perpetuate this. So he's heard a lot of this French vibrato. And, and especially when he's conducted things like Mio's Creation of the World, where maybe that's really, really quite appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and 
he would he would call me out on it when I would just do it instinctively. He'd stop me and say, "That note, stop." <laughs> he's like you know and be like you heard that right and i'm like yeah i heard that and he's like don't do that and i'm like i know i know, I know. <laughs> I, you know and it's just it's just like it's just it's just synonymous with how we hear sort of sound and texture so uh, a lot of that for me has been tempering that that instinct and moving to something maybe more um, much more static and and if anything using a slight a slight vibrato and You'll, you'll hit some some jazz players. I mean, certainly a lot of modern jazz players. I mean, they've either moved to a complete straight tone, no vibrato at all. Uh, but but there's there's something in a period sound that he likes with Stan with Stan Getz and even something closer to Paul Desmond, where vibrato is there. And that's probably been more of my model. And and I think it does it, do, it does a pretty good job of referencing both traditions. Yeah. Well, that's uh, so. That's something actually that I think is 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 happening not just to uh, music for saxophone, but composers in general. I think are drawing from a much more eclectic set of of music when they're thinking about the music that they're writing. I think you might just as likely find a saxophone piece that is bebop influenced as you might find a string quartet that is right. bebop influenced today. So I think that is one thing that's really helping kind of uh put the put the cold shower on some of those more caricatured references to 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 jazz and 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 rock and funk in yeah. saxophone music right yeah Sam, what you gonna say well i was just gonna ask about um there and a lot of saxophone music these days the 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 uh Sort of the joke line would be, you know, every young composer wants to write a sax piece, and the first thing they want to do is start writing slap tonguing. Right. Um, <laughs> All these little techniques. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris uh, Lauba kind of like uh, stirred it up, and with the slap tonguing, you know, in his etudes, and and now everybody wants to do it. And there's all kinds of extended techniques, and saxophone, I think, benefits. A, I think some of these extended techniques, single read extended techniques in general, I, I think that those single read instruments are very flexible in that way. And saxophones, uh, A, don't have to learn, you know, all this canonic music, so they've got more time to learn this stuff. And it's kind of become expected that you can double tongue and you can do slap tonguing and you can do multiphonics. Um, I was wondering if there's any, uh, you know, extended techniques in the piece. Yeah, no, there's, um, I mean, there's, there, uh, there are none. I mean, and uh, I, I actually think it's a wonderful thing. I, I yeah, think. Me too. <laughs> I, well, I think it's a wonderful thing that that you know, arguably America's foremost composer has a vision for the instrument that is removed from from some of these these cliches in the contemporary repertoire for the instrument. And I and I think he wrote you know he wrote a toneful piece. He wrote a piece that really celebrates the sound of the instrument, the the, the really the, the core sound of the instrument. And then the idea that for me it's an extended technique to be able to shift your sound constantly to be able to say, okay, this section of the piece, I'm thinking more Stravinsky, this section of the piece, I'm thinking more Eric Dolphy, this section of the piece, I'm thinking more smooth, you know, maybe even, you know, something closer to Paul Desmond, in this section of the piece, I'm thinking like, like Lenny Pickett, you know, and, 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 and there, there is that for me that I'm, that I'm trying to, to bring forth. I mentioned this to a, a peer who I who will remain nameless, uh, a, a classical saxophone player, and I mentioned this. Uh, he was asking just sort of about the piece, and he read he read something about the program note, and he meant he read something about Adams's mention about vibrato and sound, and he kind of took a little bit of offense to this, and and he said to me, uh, and I mentioned that 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 one of the most exciting aspects of the piece is just this, this shifting tone color or this idea that I'm trying to take on different characters. I mean, I do truly see the piece as like a total celebration of the saxophone. And, and I, but I mentioned this to him and he said, oh, that, that's too bad. That's really too bad. You know, as if he was looking for somebody to make such a grand statement about the true classical nature of the instrument that, 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 no, that, that, that they weren't necessarily drawing upon popular references. And, but in fact, I think it's the opposite effect. It's, it's the, it, again, it's like I said, the celebration of the instrument and the fact that all these things have influenced it. And it's all through the lens of, of, of how he writes and, and what popular, more popular music has meant to him throughout his life, which he, it's well documented how much he, you know, he had moved away from the idea of, you know, serious mm -hmm. atonal music and, and the importance of listening to jazz music when he was a student. Um, so it's, it's interesting. And, and I, and for the person who's looking for these, these techniques, 
these saxophone techniques for the person who's looking for that. They're not going to find that in this piece. And yet, I actually think that, that as a result, the piece will have more of a longstanding uh, appeal. Um, we even talked about this with Altissimo. Now, Altissimo, for those of us that don't know, it's that extended range of the saxophone. We hear it all the time. Jazz musicians take Altissimo and turn it into a real, uh, a, 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 almost a very visceral experience. The idea that, that the Altissimo notes are really meant to say, as Joe Lovano once said in Master, Master Class, he goes, those notes need to sound up there. <laughs> and it's like, and like my mind was blown. I'm like, wow, you know. And uh, and, 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 and he said, when and when you play low notes, they need to sound down there. Mm-hmm. And uh, but and, and and so there there's then these kind of cliches about altissimo where the players are really leaning into the sound. And it's meant to sound kind of gritty, and you're really str- almost straining. And that found its way into just the sound world of the altissimo. And in the classical saxophone, the idea is that this is just the next range. It needs to have the same refinement and evenness as uh, upper register clarinet playing, for instance. And, and so he wrote, when I first got the sketches, he sent me. I mean, the piece was firmly kind of mid-range. It went down to the lowest extremity of the instrument, but it just didn't push a bit beyond the standard orchestration book's top note of the saxophone, which is, is basically an octave lower than composers have written in the last 50 years for sure. Um, and I just kind of threw it out to him. I mentioned a little email. I said, you know, you, if you want, uh, I can go higher. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and I said, you could, you could view the alto saxophone as the same sounding range as clarinet. And that's kind of what I wanted him to maybe see that, that full, that full range. So the top note, uh, a, a high G four lines above the staff for clarinet is the same sounding pitch as an altissimo uh, high D above that on the alto saxophone. They're the same sounding pitch. And that, and I'm very fluent and comfortable in that range. And I, I think or that's... modern a, trained saxophone, if that's kind of like the norm right. range. Standard rep, yeah. yeah. We, we would basically say that at this at this point in the history of our... In the, this point in the, the continuum, I guess, of our instrument, the history of our instrument, it is it is just expected and common that we play three octaves, pushing up into four octaves. Yeah, uh, and that was the vision. That was the original vision of the inventor, Adolf Sax. And he over he played the instrument as an overblown instrument. It had the same uh, written range as say oboe, but he always was pushing it beyond that. And that was taken up by some of those early innovators like Sigurd Brasher, who was pushing this altissimo range as early as 1920s. Uh, we saw this with some vaudeville players. But anyway, so I guess I'm talking too long. But I said, uh, uh, I, I said I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, I can do that. I, I'm fluent up there and don't feel uh, hesitant to write up there. And and his response was very simple: that he didn't like that range. Mm-hmm. You know, he felt he felt that range, uh, at least particularly uh, in how he sort of heard it as a uh, something that showed its way into jazz. He felt it always just had kind of a certain strained quality. And even though modern classical saxophone players are expected to play in the altissimo, no matter what, no matter how good we are, it's always still risky. It, it, it's, it's, it's sort of akin to playing the highest partials on a French horn. And what we know about French horn is it's, it's uh, so good. It's a scary yeah. instrument. Yeah. It's a scary <laughs> instrument because they, they're, they're, their fundamental range that they play in so much is higher in the partials. Yeah. And, they're and so close can, together. Right, and you can just pop right off those partials. And so it's... Yeah. It is. It is very common to hear horn players, you know, miss. Great sometimes. horn players. Yeah, great horn yeah. players. I mean, it's just not. It's not uncommon, and we still, you know, we don't discredit them for that. It's something we we almost we have to have empathy for, <laughs> and, and 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 in our profession, we sort of have the same idea about autismo. You'll hear great players that just kind of crack or miss or split a tone, or then the part the partial below pops down or it drops down to the next partial below because you just weren't ready for it or your air wasn't in place or set up or whatever it may be. So I think he's heard that. I think he's, he, he didn't want to take that risk maybe. Um, and, and, but he does push the instrument uh, up to um, Altissimo G. And, and even at the, 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 the last phrase of the piece, when the orchestra is just, it's just this wall of polyrhythm going on. And I'm sitting on top of that and he pushes me out of the texture and, and finally gives us the satisfaction of getting us up to that note. So I think he, I do think he masterfully saves those so those, those ranges of the instrument, um, and he doesn't want it to sound hard up there at all. Right. But, you, know, you mentioned but, earlier the the relentlessness of this piece and how it's it's similar to the relentlessness of, of gnarly buttons and how it just 
keeps going and the, there's you mentioned you know there's one spot that's really like the the tricky spot but in general the a lot of the virtuosity just comes from the fact that it's keeping on going right. um and uh one thing that struck me it, that wasn't really mentioned in the program notes till the very end this is a 32 minute concerto so you <laughs> yeah, know right. wear wear comfortable <laughs> shoes <Right>. um <laughs> is an important part of performing this i, I, uh, I, I do need to think about that you're right so <laughs> Pro tip, wear comfortable shoes when standing for 30 minutes and performing. But, um, <laughs> an, you know, we we read a piece, that, and this was all over the, the internet this week, from Kevin Putz, wrote a, a Pulitzer-winning composer of um, several very large works. It's his Pulitzer is for a, an opera, Silent Night. And... Um, I'm wondering what, how you feel about the scale of a work like this and how that is different from the scale of a work like City Noir and maybe how that, one thing Putz was talking about was how that appeals to a lay audience that's not used to having to pay that close attention to anything for a half an hour. Right. I think we're in a very, we're in a very different time, right? I mean, it's, that's a lot, that's a lot to latch onto for a long time. And, I think he, in some ways, I, he he has been insecure about how long it is. I mean, he he when he took his uh, his oratorio was that way. The the string quartet concerto piece, absolute jazz was that way. His pieces for him, I think he the, the, the how he wants to set a piece up just is you can count on the bass being 20, 25 minutes, and then he's got to figure out how to maybe thread things together in a way that probably adds some material or finding a way to get out of something he's doing and he wants to do it in a, in a craft or a craftful way. So it just sort of pushes. I think his initial, the initial idea was 25, 22 minutes. And then it just kept kind of building and he felt, he felt bad about that. He's like, I hope, uh, I hope it's not too long. He's like, is this too long for a SAS concerto? He said, but, but he just said he did, he didn't feel he could take anything away. And that really appealed to me, the idea that he wasn't just going to wrap this up. Let's just wrap this up and figure out a way to get out of this. And I've seen composers do that. I mean, some composers that if their if they're time limit or their maybe the, the time limit they've set up in their mind uh, is 18 minutes, 20 minutes, or the commission was for 12 to 18 minutes or something like that, they're going to figure out a way to do it. And maybe it shortchanges the, the, just the, the, the arc of the piece or the scale of the work. Um, yeah, I... I mean, for us, for it to be that long, I mean, hopefully, hopefully the length will, uh, hopefully the quality supports the length. I mean, and I, I feel it does. And I, he, he tends to take you on that. He's done this with all these works recently where they, you have these two massive long parts, and which is basically a fast and a slow movement. Those are connected uh, mm -hmm. under one, maybe Ataka or, or just, just one kind of, um, overarching movement and then there's a break and he, he sort of gives the audience that moment uh and then and then a short last movement or the, a short so the, the second movement is, is just under six minutes mm -hmm. yet the first movement is like 24 or something like that right. you know so um he, he at least gives you at least gives you a break a little bit and he did that with city noir and that was 35 minutes city noir i've i felt that city noir i mean i don't know i mean I think the general sense is that City Noir has been wildly successful. But you will see for every you know, three reviews of the piece, you'll see one that just really kind of tears it apart for being long and kind of just unfolding for so much. And, and the audience really can't uh, latch on to anything um, to the point. And, and he's, he, he's sort of working with increasingly so. It seems like he's working with these just very dense textures, you know, on a – like something that, that's more akin to Ravel or Mahler or something, just really thick textures. And yeah. some people have, you know, some people with less trained ears are having a hard time following that. I don't think that's the case with this piece because, one, the orchestration is smaller. There's no low brass in this piece, and there's no percussion in this piece. There's a, a wickedly hard piano part, I mean, on, that's really equal to the solo sax part, I think. And there's a there's a really interesting chalice part and a heart part that's just a beautiful color uh, color instrument, and then you have winds and pairs. You have one bass clarinet um, and full strings, and so so he sort of I think he's built into the piece. It's as if he built it around the, needing to hear the saxophone. I think he's aware of those textural issues, 
uh, the, the, the timbral and textural issues we sometimes encounter. But I think he's given enough that the piece breathes a lot more than City Noir, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's, a lot yeah. more hole, there's a lot more holes texturally in it. And I think when I've listened to it, even just the MIDI, I feel like, I feel like 30 minutes just kind of flies by. Yeah, and, and, and you know, even, yeah, it's interesting to me. I'm a big fan of Adam's music, and um, you know, you're talking about pieces like Putz makes the point about symphonies. Um, young composers are encouraged to not write an orchestral, a long orchestral piece because it won't be played. You'd write a um, two minute it's, opener, right? right. <laughs> but it seems like the tradition of writing a really long symphonic piece is grew out of, you know, a, a time when the biggest concern was access. You write a big, long piece because the people who are going to hear it are not going to hear it any other time, at least other than like a forehand piano reduction, than right then. So, of course, it's going to be a bigger event. It's going to be longer. And hearing a new composer who can write a piece that's really engaging and doesn't seem to be long just because the tradition is to write long pieces, you know, um, is refreshing because I think... Some people do write long pieces just because they think that's the thing that a composer does. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like the challenge for composers, how to make something work for, for 30, 35 minutes. Um, but I'm also curious, um, Tim, as to how that challenge uh, expresses itself in the the your creative input to the piece. How, how do you manage saxophoning for a half an hour and keeping keeping what you're doing interesting until the end yeah there are actual logistical concerns that yeah. well not just that but artistic concerns well both yeah i suppose yeah it is, it is both you're, you're i mean there's actual there, there's an actual reality here that says will your equipment hold up for 30 minutes? right <laughs> <laughs> i mean like that's something that we talk i always joke about this with with friends and students you know that your your uh, your reed and your horn can only take so many hit points you know, and then you need, a, and then and then you need like a lifeline or something. It's like, you know, or for the Dungeons and Dragons reference. Awesome. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there there are certain realities about how long a read. There's actually there, there are certain issues about how long a read can hold out, and and um, so um, over the course of at least there's there are some there are some moments there are moments where you can just kind of take a breath. I mean, he'll have like an eleven bar, an eleven measure orchestral interlude. You know, and that's it. And that's time for you to just kind of suck the spit out. If there's been accumulating in the mouthpiece, you've got to make sure if something's going wrong with the reed or it's warping, it's dry in the hall. You've got to make sure, okay, you, you need to check it out. You see us all the time. You, I, I think people hate watching woodwind players and brass players play concertos because we have to spend time dumping spit valves and we have to we spend time finicking, fit, finicking with reeds and everything. Um, I mean, the closest thing I guess that happens in the string world is there's this risk of their string breaking on stage, and it happens, right? And you see this happen where, like, the concertmaster hands the violinist a replacement <laughs> instrument or something. That's happened. I mean, that's like their worst nightmare. Um, but they do have to pace that. They have to pace. For instance, a violinist has to pace like how long, how long they play and how old their strings are, and um, or how new their strings are and what that's going to do. So. We have those logistical issues when it comes to like reeds and setup and what will how it will be affected, breathing, just pick the pacing of breathing. Um, but uh, artistically, uh, I, I think I think the piece has this for me. It has this unfolding quality that just keeps pulling me in deeper and deeper. So the piece opens with this big bang, and it's just these kind of just it almost has very kind of early Adams references to it. These just these really pulsing, pushing, ascending. Uh, uh, triplets throughout the piece that are that are basically he's got modal modulations or modal modal shifting happening on every beat so it's just he's just moving throughout and it's really cool and it just has this kind of like splashy you've 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 uh, uh, you the, the movie starts in the middle of a of a of a of a, of a chase scene or something like that you know it has that quality and and it's all there and it's all texture all the time and it's just this just just this onslaught of of saxophone and and that that he in some ways i think gives you a chance to really uh i mean maybe i'll have to know i won't know i guess until um those first rehearsals just how physical i'll need to play like how big the orchestration really is there or what do i need to save i'm gonna have to save it a little bit to get yeah. to the because he does put this big coda at the end this presto at the very end it's actually not very long but it's it's actually some of the hardest music of the piece, and he saves it for the very very last page or so, 
And so that's, if that's going to happen around minute 30, <laughs> then uh, I've got to be ready for that. So I've actually, in my practicing, I tend to work backwards in the piece. I, I, I've practiced the, the last five minutes maybe uh, in the last month or so, more so than the beginning. Um, because the beginning is what I had the most experience with when I got the early, uh, the early sketches. But um, I, I, I tend to have these musical mental markers as I march through the piece. Uh, th this piece I'm going for more of a, you know, kind of a bop sound. And this, this part of the piece I'm going for this really like glacial, uh, uh, just long architectural sounds. Of these, uh, I love how th there, there, there's, mo there's like one moment in the piece that I was really hopeful would, would kind of, Grow, uh, would be born out of this relationship that he that he would uh, allow for a moment of peace for there to just be some beautiful gorgeous uh, just these landscape type sonorities that he's pretty famous for um, there's a great orchestra piece called naive and sentimental music do you know this piece yes Yes. Um, but it, it it unfolds just incredibly and then there's this bassoon solo that emerges that is just mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, I can't imagine it's not in all their excerpts. And if it's not, they're missing out. But it's a, <laughs> it's this giant solo for bassoon. And I remember hearing that piece once, imagining like what that would be like on a saxophone, how beautiful it would be. And he gives me some of that. You know, he gives me some of that. But it's all, but it's all for me, like in this beautiful ballad style. It, it reminds me of something Sarah Vaughan would be singing. Um, but it's it, it's like the fusion of that, and he does that really well. So yep. he gives you that he does give you a moment. He gives you musically moments to relax, um, and then there's some driving stuff. And there's just sort of one moment. He was really nervous early on um, of, of this sounding just like City Noir. I mean, he, he I think he, he realized again it was kind of how fast things ended up moving. He I think he was a little nervous just artistically for him. How could he separate those two pieces, or or, or is this considered just you know this the, the the, the sequel to City Noir, and I don't think it's the sequel to City Noir. I think you you won't you won't get away from the relation uh, from the uh, association association of saxophone to that piece. Um, but the orchestra is totally different. He's removed texturally just this grand scale of City Noir and turned it into almost like this you know classical period orchestra sound um, with everyone playing in almost a, a big band um, a big band way. And uh, um, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm getting some, some weird things happening with the video, but I can hear you just fine. So we just okay. keep going. Okay. So, um, um, yeah, so I think there's a, there's a, there are those associations just, uh, just inherent. Um, but I do think he achieved something separate. And, and there, but there is one big moment. But he, if, if, in City Noir, there's this, this probably the most iconic moment in the piece, for me at least, or I think people would associate is in the third movement of, City Noir, there's this big saxophone solo in Boulevard Night, and, and, um, and everyone calls it his Stravinsky section. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, do you have my video? Did you lose my video? No, I lost everybody's video. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, well, I'm just going to make sure my video's there. That's... Um, well, I lost it. It's uh, all right. Okay. Is it okay? Keep yeah, going? I, uh, yeah, just keep going. The audio's okay. fine. That's the important okay. part. All right, great. Um, but... Uh, uh, that, that they always joke about it is sort of the rite of spring moment in City Noir, and uh, and it really does have that. I mean, I don't think he would honestly say he was trying to rip off Rite of Spring, but it has this kind of driving shum 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 shum. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the infernal dance moment. But he, uh, uh, the saxophone solo comes up, and it's finally this this big. It's as if all of the motives have finally culminated in this solo, and these it's all these cast kind of ascending arpeggiatic things, and then it. It's really intervolic, so really hard excerpt, and um, and uh, then the brass have to imitate it, and the trumpet players always really struggle with it. But uh, it, it, anyway, it, it's this it's it's this mo probably the most iconic moment in that whole piece. And there is a moment in this piece that that you know I joked that if there was any relationship to City Noir, it's right here, and he and he would agree. And I think he he liked the idea that that it has this slight connection to it, as if someone can. Uh, it, it gives someone maybe a framework for how to listen to it, and 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 uh, it happens. It doesn't happen in the same moment in the piece, but it's really really hard. It's really hard, and it involves me playing the hardest music in the piece against this wall of sound. So yeah. I, yeah.
Well, at yeah, the Jim. risk of at the risk of our podcast approaching the the scale of uh, a large <laughs> opera, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think we should probably uh, wrap it up. Tim, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Hey. It was great talking yeah. to you. Thank you, guys. This means a lot. I really appreciate this and the support for the the, the piece and uh, uh, and. Uh, I hope I hope everyone hears it, and loves it. I think it's the piece has a great future for our instrument. Well, yeah. we had a great time talking to you. You're welcome back anytime. You want to tell people where they can uh, follow you and where they can hear you coming up? Um, well, I, I, I I've been almost I'm almost complete have completed uh, building my schedule page on my website timothymcallister.com. It's at least current uh, pretty. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, we haven't announced our Prism Quartet season just yet. Uh, we do have a Carnegie Hall recital in Zankel Hall on October 15th, playing music of Stephen Mackey uh, and um, a Greek composer, uh, Kumandakis. And we um, there's there's a, there's there's reasons that, that they're paired, paired this way. But um, and uh, that's the big thing for the fall. We have some big stuff coming up in the spring that that, that uh, we announced recently uh, with some collaborations. With some famous jazz jazz artists, composers like Dave Liebman, Greg Osby, Miguel Zenon, Rudresh Mahathapa, uh, Steve Lehman, they're all writing pieces for us in which they will also play with us. And so that's going to be the back end of our season. That's really huge. We're excited Fantastic. about that. But, but everything uh, everything's current with um, with these pieces or with the the Adams Run in the United States. Uh, where to get tickets. Uh, as well as some other things I'm doing. I'm playing the Chicago Symphony a few times, just some of the orchestral works uh, and some other solo appearances across the country. So hope you can check that out. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, we'll have links to all those things on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. If you're watching this live, thank you so much for joining us. We always enjoy following the, the chat room. So thanks to everyone who did that. We do this show every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So you can join us at soundnotion.tv slash live. If you're watching this after the fact, you can still tell us what you thought. Again, at our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also connect with us on all your favorite social media outlets. You can... Uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDowell. Sam is at House Goy. Nate is at a Nate Tree. Uh, Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Tim is at McAllister Sachs. Uh, if you'd like to follow uh, John Adams, whose music we've been talking about most of the morning, he's at Hell Tweet. His website is uh, earbox.com. Um, and we'll have links to all that stuff uh, in our notes where you um, can hear a clip of the saxophone. Yes, you should absolutely too. go and go to earbox.com, listen to a little bit of a uh, MIDI realization of a little clip. It's a very cool thing, even though it's tiny. You hear the kind of, you know, walking bass thing and some some really cool Dolphy-ish uh, saxophone uh, and it's a, realizing. It's a really top. It's a really top tier MIDI orchestra too. Yeah, yeah, it's one yeah. of the one of the <laughs> finest MIDI orchestras you'll hear this year. Um, <laughs> He spends a lot of money on those patches, he says. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you should definitely check it out because it, it, I mean, we're making jokes about the, the MIDI, but it's actually really cool music and you should, it's definitely worth your time. You can subs subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store. Um, the, the two shows we have right now are, are this show and a uh, uh, film music show called Streamers and Punches. And we just did an interview in this past episode of Streamers and Punches with um, uh, Michael Price, who's one of the composers for the BBC series Sherlock. So you should absolutely check that out uh, if, if that sounds like something interesting to you. If you'd like to support the show, you can use the Amazon affiliate search link on our site, on the right side of the site. Just whatever you're buying from Amazon, if you search for it in that little box, uh, we get a little commission. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't even look any different to you, but it really helps us out, and we appreciate that. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week.